the National Broadcasting Company present transcribed Sir Lawrence Olivier in Theatre Royal. This is Laurence Olivier. We have before now introduced in this series stories by Robert Louis Stevenson. Today we have chosen perhaps the best known tale he ever wrote. Possibly the best known Grand Guignol classic in literature. Also for me it has the attraction of one of the most fascinating dual roles ever created. So now it is my pleasure to invite you to listen to Robert Louis Stevenson's story, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> by that name I pray heaven to be remembered. By profession, I am a doctor of medicine, a fellow of the Royal Society, a doctor of laws and of civil law. Born to a large fortune, I think I can also say on my own behalf that I'm inclined by nature to industry and fond of the respect of the wise and good among my fellow men and was once, as might have been supposed, one with every guarantee of an honorable and distinguished future. If I can hope for that no longer, well, the future is not in my hands. As for the past, the immediate past, how am I to tell it to you? For the story of my undoing is not the story of myself alone. If you are to understand it aright, it must begin as the story of another. The story of Dr. Jekyll will end and must now begin with the story of Edward Hyde. Hold it. Don't let him get away. Is the child badly hurt? Take your hands off me, you fools. Let me go. Let you go. If there was a policeman here, I should have you given in charge. Don't you realize you might have killed the poor child? The idiot's got in my way. Got in your way? Is that any reason for knocking her down and trampling on her? Are you out of your mind? I have more important things to think about than children. There's no reason for leaving them half dead on the pavement. Is the child badly hurt? Her head's cut. Poor little mite. Ah. She should be sent to prison trampling on a poor little kid like that. Did you see what he did to her, sir? The ugly brute. Yes, I saw the whole thing. And I happen to be a lawyer. You haven't heard the last of this young man. You're going to pay for it, believe me. Let go of me. What do you want? Money? I want to see some slight evidence of your humanity. The child may be badly hurt. She must be examined by a doctor. And as for you, I should be prepared to give evidence against you in the court. If you choose to make capital out of an accident, naturally I'm helpless. It was no accident. Yep. Very well, name your figure. No gentleman wishes to get himself mixed up in a public scene. How much do you want? If you wish to keep this out of the courts, you can pay the parents of the child a hundred pounds. If not, I'll make your name known from one end of London to the other. Now, ten pounds with me, you can have that. A hundred pounds was what I said. You can afford it from the looks of you. And unless you take steps to get it immediately, I shall hand you over to the police. Mm, very well, if you insist. I'll get the money. Come with me. Right. The young man led them to the door of a gloomy house not far away. He let himself in with a key, and in a few minutes reappeared with a check in his hand. He handed it over with a cynical smile. Let me see that. Ninety pounds payable to bearer. And ten pounds here in cash. Well, are you satisfied now? But, but the signature, I know it. Henry Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll. He's a client and friend of mine. <laughs> in that case, you'll know the signature's genuine. Yeah, but where did you get it? Is Dr. Jekyll in that house? The check is genuine. That's all that concerns you. Then what is your name? Are you a friend of Dr. Jekyll? Yes, I'm a friend of his. You may have even heard my name. Did you say that you're Dr. Jekyll's lawyer? What is your name? Allow me to give you my card. We may see more of each other. That is my address. And as you see, the name is... Edward Hyde. The name was Edward Hyde. As for the signature on the check, Henry Jekyll, that was genuine enough, for I had written the check myself. Nor was I surprised to receive a visit from the lawyer the following morning. 
for it was not the first time that the name of Edward Hyde had been discussed between us. Once again, Rico, who is this Edward Hyde? He's a friend of mine. But this will that you've made out in favor of him, all that you possess, made over to him in the event of your disappearance. Why? And what's the meaning behind the phrase disappearance or unexplained absence for any period exceeding three calendar months? Why should you disappear suddenly? I have my reasons for that clause, Utterson. You must forgive me for not disclosing them. Look, Chico, there's something strange about all this. The only explanation I can think of is that Edward Hyde, whoever the fellow is, must have some hold over you. My guess is that he's blackmailing you. Oh, I tell you, that's absurd. Edward Hyde is a friend of mine, and I'm simply indebted to him for things he's done for me. You know what I saw, one? Edward Hyde is a scoundrel. What can there possibly be between such a creature and a man like you? I, I, I prefer not to discuss him with you. If you like, you can say that my situation is a painful one. I don't deny that my relationship with Edward Hyde is a strange one. A very strange one. But it is one that cannot be mended by talking. You still won't take me into your confidence, Henry. No. After all, we're old friends. Yes. There's nothing to fear. No, believe me, I, I dare not. As for last night's incident, I'm deeply sorry for the child. So is Edward Hyde, who told me the whole story after you had gone. Believe me, I take a very great interest in him for all his faults. And if I'm taken away, I wish you to promise me that you will bear with him and get his rights for him. I think you would if you knew all. And yeah. it would be a weight off my mind if you would promise. Well, I can't pretend that I shall ever like him. Oh, I don't ask that. I only ask for justice. I only ask you to help him for my sake when I'm no longer here. Very well. I promise. <laughs> was heard of Edward Hyde. It was as though he had vanished off the face of the earth. If only he had done so indeed. As it was, his reappearance some few months later was the occasion of a terrible tragedy. And once again, I found myself involved in something over which I had ceased to have any control. Jico, uh, this is Inspector Newcomb of Scotland Yard. Ah. He's investigating the death of Sir Danvers Carey, who was found murdered in the street late last oh, night. Oh, sit down, Inspector. Anything I can do to help you. Thank you, sir. I read of the tragedy in the papers this morning. It was a terrible crime. Is anything known about it yet? Yes, Dr. Jekyll. A warrant has been issued for the arrest of a man that I believe you may be able to help us to trace. Uh, someone I know? His name is Edward Hyde. Edward Hyde? Oh, but no. There must be some mistake. He, he isn't here anymore. He, he, he's gone away. Um, out of the country. What makes you think... A letter I was could... found by the murdered man. He had gone out to post it when he was attacked. The letter was addressed to Mr. Utterson here. That's how he came to be involved. He identified the body and also this broken stick which was found on the scene of the crime. Ah. We have reason to believe it was the stick used by the murderer, that Sir Danvers was beaten to death with it, in cold blood. May I ask whether you have ever seen it before? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, it belonged to me once, it... It was given to me some years ago by Mr. Utterson here. That's what I told the inspector. Have you seen it recently, uh, Dr. Jekyll? No, no, not recently. I, I lost it some months ago. You see, it was found... As you see, sir, the stick has been broken in two during the attack. This half was found in the street beside the body of the murdered man. The other half, also blood-stained, was found in the room of Mr. Edward Hyde early this morning. Oh, but surely there must be some mistake. There is no mistake. The attack was seen by Sir Danvers maid. It was a bright moonlight night, and she was looking from her window as Sir Danvers went out. She saw him talking to Hyde in the street. She recognized him, and she saw him strike Sir Danvers down. It was on her evidence that we went round to Hyde's rooms in Soho. As you know, he gave me his address the last time I saw him. Uh, may I ask when was the last time you saw him? I, I don't remember. Not for some months. I was told he'd gone abroad. You're sure he's not been here last night or this morning? I would tell you if he had. Well, if he should call here, you will inform the police immediately. He is a dangerous man, Dr. Jekyll. My men will be posted outside in case he shows up. As it is, you will be required to give evidence of the inquest. Yes, yes, of course. I will do anything I can. This has been a terrible shock to me. Well, I'm sorry you should have been implicated, sir. Now, uh, if you'll excuse yes, me... Goodbye, Inspector. I will do all I can to help you. Uh, thank you, sir. Good day, Mr. Utterson. Good day. Well, Henry, as you know, Sir Danvers was a client of mine, but so are you. Now that you've got mixed up in this terrible thing, I want to know what I'm doing. Will you swear to me that you're holding nothing back? 
You haven't been mad enough to help this fellow escape. Artisan, upon my honor. I swear to heaven I'll never have anything more to do with him in this world. My friendship with him is over. Oh, thank heavens for that. I tell you, Henry, I told you before. This man is a scoundrel, a dangerous maniac. Till he's put out of the way, none of us will be safe, least of all you. Edward Hyde will never be heard of again. He's safely out of the way already. Ah, can you be sure of that? Well, if he's brought to trial, your own name will appear. As it is, you're dangerously involved. I'm quite sure of him now. To be honest with you, I have received a letter a from letter? him. A letter? Then why didn't you give it to the inspector? Well, I, I needed your advice first. I didn't wish to get mixed up in the business any more than I am already. Read this. Dear Jico, when you receive this, you will know what I've done. I can offer no excuse for myself, so I will trouble you with none. I have repaid you unworthily for your many kindnesses, but I shall never again give you cause to regret them. I'm going away, and you need have no further fears for me. Where I am going, no one will ever find me. Goodbye, and forgive me. It would hide. There. Yeah. If, if you advise me to do so, I will give it to the police. Where's the envelope? I have burnt it before I realized what I was doing. But there was no postmark. The letter was handed in the door. Can Poole describe the man who brought it? No, it was left in my surgery. He must have come round through the garden. Uh, what should I do with it? I will take it. I want to think about it a little more. Tell me one thing. That clause in your will about your disappearing. It was Hyde who dictated that, wasn't it? Yes. I knew it. Fool, Henry, don't you see it all? The man intended to murder you as well when it suited him. You make a will in his favor, leaving him your whole fortune. You insert a clause in that will that if you disappear for only three months, you're to be presumed dead, and all your fortune handed over to him without any further inquiry. You, you too must be out of your mind. Well, there were reasons. I can't tell you. These papers here on the table. Whose are they? Those, there are some notes I was making about an experiment. May I look at them for a moment? If you wish. This is your handwriting, isn't it? Uh, yes. And this is the handwriting of Edward Hyde, this note you gave me. Um, yes, I, I think so. Aren't you sure? Don't you recognize well, it? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, of course. I, I know his handwriting quite well. But what are you doing? I'm comparing your handwriting with the writing in this note that you say was written by Edward Hyde. I happen to know a certain amount about graphology. The writing of the note is different, obviously, in many ways. The slope of the letters are different. But the formation of the letters and the pressure of the hand is the same. This note is a clumsy forgery. I tell you that you forged it yourself. I... Uh, you don't deny it. Will you tell me why you wrote it? Why you, a man of honor, would turn to forgery to protect a murderer? If only I could have told him. If only I'd had the courage. Even if I had had the courage, would he have believed me? Not unless I'd given him the proof of what I said. The proof which I dare no longer give. The proof which would have sent me to the gallows. The proof that Dr. Cheekill and Edward Hyde were one and the same being. Or rather, that Edward Hyde was the evil part of me. In a moment, we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. You'll enjoy the parade of fine listening in store tomorrow on NBC, when noted Italian maestro Guido Cantelli returns to the podium of the NBC Symphony in another brilliant concert from Carnegie Hall. The famed conductor has chosen music of varied styles and periods with work by Haydn, Hindemith, and Wagner for tomorrow's music classics with the NBC Symphony. And remember to enjoy the latest edition of Weekend, your Sunday newspaper of the air. The only Sunday paper you can safely enjoy while driving in your car. You'll meet such notables as Merrill Muller, Elmo Roper, and Earl Godwin with the latest news highlights of the week from all corners of the world. Mel Allen covers the sports world and Earl Wilson the Broadway beat. There's everything from cover stories to feature items on home, fashions, and people, all on Weekend on NBC. And later there's fine dramatic listening in store on the family comedy series The Marriage when Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy, as the delightful Marriott's, find their household a trifle unsettled when Liz becomes a career woman again. And if you're a Western adventure fan, stay with NBC for another thrilling six-shooter drama when Britt Ponsett discovers a lynching party has chosen the wrong man. James Stewart portrays your six-shooter hero in this exciting drama of the Western Plains on NBC. And now we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. The 
murder of Sir Danvers Carey remained unpunished, for the murderer could not be found. Despite the hue and cry, Edward Hyde had disappeared as though he had never existed. Much of his past was unearthed and all of it was criminal. Tales were told of him by those who had known him, tales of a callous and violent life lived among criminal companions, tales of the hatred and contempt he had evoked among all who had crossed his path. But as to his present whereabouts, not a whisper. Edward Hyde had vanished, and I alone could have solved the mystery. <laughs> well, Chico, this is quite a reunion. Uh, yes, How long is it since Lanyon and you and I spent the last evening oh, together? Far too long, I'm afraid. Yes. I'd begun to think that Dr. Lanyon would never have dinner with me again. Oh, well, yes. if it's my fault, I'm sorry about that. Oh, oh, Chico and I had a disagreement <laughs> professionally some years ago. We yes. agreed to go our separate ways. Mm. Well, who shall affirm when doctors disagree? <laughs> ah, <laughs> what is it all about? A wrong diagnosis? No, no, no. Dr. Lanyon took exception to a line of research I was interested oh. in. I think he disapproved of some of my experiments. Well, frankly, I told him he was going in for a lot of unscientific balderdash. Oh, better wow. suited to an alchemist than a doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I could still surprise you, Lanyon, if I wanted to. Those experiments were not so unscientific as you imagined. Well, I still don't want to hear about oh, them. Very well, then we'll change the subject. But well, one of these days, I may convince you... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> One of these days, if it had only stayed as indefinite as that. But Dr. Lanyon was to be convinced before the month was out, and the discovery was to bring about his death. One morning, later that January, Dr. Lanyon received a letter. The letter was signed with my name, Henry G. Kill, and asked him to do me a certain service in the name of our old friendship. At midnight, there was a knock on his door. You come from Dr. Jekyll? Yes. Then come in, please. Have you got it? Have you got it? No, 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 just a moment. You seem to forget that I don't know you. I beg your pardon, as you say, but I'm here on behalf of Dr. Jekyll, and the matter is very urgent. No doubt. From the tone of Dr. Jekyll's letter, I gathered it must be. The letter asked me to collect some drugs from a cabinet in his surgery, a drawer full of drugs, and bring them here. I was sworn to secrecy and was asked to deliver those drugs to someone who would call here for them at midnight. Are you that man? Yes, give them to me. Where are they? Where are they? Well, the drawer's on that table. Give me a graduated glass, quickly. There's one there on the desk. Would you mind telling me what all this mystery is now about? Now then, now, you see? At first, the solution is reddish. As I add the crystals, it turns to a dark purple. It effervesces and gives off a slight vapor. Hmm? And now, as the crystals dissolve, it is turning, turning to a watery green. You see? Yes, I, I see all that, but what I don't see is... <laughs> well, what... Dr. Lanyon, which is it to be? Shall I take this little glass full of liquid away with me? Or is your curiosity too much for you? Will you be left as you are, neither richer nor wiser? Or shall I show you a sight to stagger the unbelief of Satan? Which is it to be? After all this nonsense, I, I might as well see the end of it. Very well, then. You're a doctor and you remember your vows. What follows is under the seal of our profession. You didn't believe in the virtue of transcendental medicine, did you? Well, watch me closely while I drink this little glassful off. <laughs> What have you done? <laughs> Henry Jico. You, but I, I don't understand. I don't understand. No, no, my dear Lanyon. You don't understand how Dr. Henry Jico can suddenly appear through the likeness of someone else. If you'd listen to me believed in the experiments that I was so wrapped up in, well, perhaps you would have understood it better, well enough perhaps to be a partner in a strange and new crusade for the redemption of the human soul. Henry, Jekyll, I, 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 I don't understand. Just exactly what formula I have discovered, well, that must remain my secret. But you can believe in its power, for you have seen that power with your own eyes. Sit down, man, and listen. It was many years ago that I first learned to recognize the thorough and primitive duality of man. 
I saw that two natures were contending in the field of my own consciousness, which you may call, if you like, the good and the evil. I saw that if those two natures could be separated, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. The unjust might go his way without remorse, and the just could do the good in which he believed without any fear of his own imperfections. Well, I succeeded in finding the secret of that separation. But how? How? Oh. It's not possible to trace the whole journey, but the drug that I discovered has power to control and shake the very fortress of our identity. I discovered that drug, and a year or two ago, I tried it on myself. I suffered the most racking pains. You saw me suffer them again just now. Grinding of the bones, a deadly nausea, and a horror of the spirit that cannot be exceeded at the hour of birth or death. Then the agonies began to subside, and I came to myself again. Myself, to one part of myself, a separation of the lower elements in my soul. There was something strange in my sensations, something indescribably new and incredibly sweet. From its very novelty, I felt younger, lighter, happier in body, reckless and wicked. Oh, yes, ten times more wicked, a slave to my own original evil. I had shrunk in size, but I had gained in the exaltation of my senses. I looked in the mirror and saw what I had become. For the first time in the history of mankind, I saw a man who was compounded only of evil. There in the mirror, I saw the likeness of Edward Hyde. Edward Hyde? Edward Hyde, the murderer? Yes, the murderer to be. But Edward Hyde did many things before he committed murder. From that day forth, I had the choice of my two characters. The one wholly evil, the other a compound of evil and good. The Dr. Henry Jekyll that the world respected. And of those two, you chose the worse. The one that was wholly ah, evil. Occasionally, only in the character of Edward Hyde, I sought out the pleasures that were denied to me as the respectable man. I took rooms in Soho, made myself known to Jekyll's friends in the character of Hyde, even altered my will in Hyde's behalf. If anything happened to Henry Jekyll, Edward Hyde could still enjoy the pleasures of life. You mean the drug could work both ways? It could overcome evil and bring you back to yourself? Mm, as you see, by day I could live my proper life, compounded of good and evil as all of us are, and by night I could roam the city under the most impenetrable of disguises. And Edward Hyde could commit his murders without any fear of detection? No such idea in mind when I started the adventure. The pleasures I enjoyed may have been vicious, but it was in the hands of Edward Hyde that they soon began to become criminal. This familiar that I called out of my own soul was a being inherently evil. He was selfish, bestial, and relentless. At times I stood aghast before his acts, but the situation was apart from ordinary laws and seemed to relax the grasp of my conscience. When I realized what I had done, what Edward Hyde had done, I was horrified, horrified, and, and terrified. From that day forth, I've never taken the drug again. Oh, and you expect me to believe that? When you come here, into this very room, as Edward Hyde himself. Ah, ah, ah but I, I don't know what happened, but yesterday, in the park, I was sitting there on the bench, drowsing in the sunshine. Perhaps it was my conscience that was drowsing. Perhaps I was dreaming of all the things that I had done when Edward Hyde was alive in me. And suddenly, a qualm came over me, a terrible nausea and the most deadly shuddering. I must have fainted. But when I regained my senses, I looked down at my hands. They changed. They were corded, hairy hands, the hands of Edward Hyde, the murderer. My whole body had shrunk. My clothes hung formlessly and grotesquely about me as they did about the man you saw here half an hour ago. I was in a panic, a hunted murderer, wanted by the police. The drugs that I had needed to regain my proper identity, they were back in my surgery, and I dare not go back to fetch them, for my own butler would have turned me over to the police. In despair, I wrote you that letter asking you to fetch the drugs for me here. You did so, and you've saved me. I have saved you. Yes. I loathe you and despise you. To me, you're more evil than Edward Hyde himself, for it was only by your desires that he came alive at all. Why should I not denounce you to the police myself? Why should I take you on my conscience? What other crimes are you capable of committing? Oh, London, London, I beg you. I've learned my lesson. From now on, Edward Hyde is dead. I shall never venture anywhere without the drugs that can keep him in his cage. Dr. Lanyon did not denounce me to the police. The shock of that discovery proved too much for him. And in a very short time, Dr. Lanyon was dead. From that day forth, I too have changed. It is no longer the fear of the gallows. It is the fear of being Edward Hyde that wrecks me. I still hate and fear the thought of the brute that sleeps within me. 
But never again shall he break out in all his horrible infamy. The drug shall be used only to purge his evil, never to set it free. As for this confession that I'm writing... to me. Oh, the nausea, the, the terrible pain. No. 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 Not again. No. Not that. No. Quick. Quick. The, the, the drug. Where's the drug? The solution. Where's the crystals? Quickly. You go quickly. <laughs> Is there still no change? Has it lost its power then, this wonderful drug of yours? Does it no longer work its miracle? Dr. Deacon. Dr. Deacon, are you all right, sir? Yes, I'm all right. Go away. Open the door, sir. You don't find Go away, you fool. There's nothing wrong with me. Deacon, open this door at once. It's hide there with you. No, no, no. It's me, Henry Dickel. Go away, I'm busy. If you don't open this door, I'll smash it in. Quickly. The drug. More of it. More. Before they get in. If they catch me like this, I'm done for. The drug. Oh, it doesn't it work anymore. Hi. Smash this door. Go away. The drug. Why doesn't it work anymore? He shot himself. Mr. Hyde has shot himself. Where's the doctor? Where's Dr. Jekyll? He must have been here a moment ago. Look, this report on the table. In his writing, and the ink's still wet. Uh, Dr. Jekyll! Dr. Jekyll! Ah. True statement of Dr. Henry Jekyll touching the case of Edward Hyde. When this testimony is read, I shall be dead. And the discovery which I have made will have died along with me. For as this testimony will make too evident, my discovery was incomplete. Dr. Jekyll! Where are you, Dr. Jekyll? Yes, Henry Jekyll. If this is a true statement, where are you indeed? <laughs> This is Laurence Olivier again. This week, in our adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, our cast included William Mervyn, Russell Napier, Campbell Singer, and John Fraser. I look forward to the pleasure of your company next week when I shall introduce another play. Until then, au revoir, and thank you. De Laurence Olivier starred in today's transcribed program. The script was by Derek Patmore. The music was under the direction of Sidney Torch. Theatre Royal is an NBC presentation produced and directed by Harry Allen Towers.